Hi, Sam here, and welcome back to the show. This is volume three of the Q&A series, so I'm going to dive into half a dozen questions again, try and give plenty of detail and help you out, those of you who ask questions. So, first question for today, how long have you been training? Now, this actually comes up really regularly, probably when I get stopped by someone out and about or just get talking to someone about training or complete strangers asking me about this stuff. One of the most common questions to come up is, oh, how long have you been training? And it's, it's difficult. I mean, I can literally give an answer. It's 20 years. I started training when I was 17 and I'm now 37. So that's the answer. But I always wonder, how can I be more helpful or what are they really getting at? Because, it, you know, if they're just making conversation, then that's the answer and, and, and we move on. But if you, if you kind of want to know from a perspective of what can be done over what kind of time frame, I'd like to give a little bit more detail there because I have to be honest, I haven't been like so focused and completely consistent for those whole 20 years. And I've dabbled with some other sports, playing rugby for a couple of years and being involved in athletics and running. And so my focus and dedication to it hasn't been the same throughout those whole 20 years. It's been more the last kind of six years that I've been really kind of on it. So difficult to say what's what's the most helpful answer there. I think the point that I've got to could probably be achieved with all of the right approach and consistency and all of the knowledge or probably the knowledge outsourced to a coach if you didn't want to waste any time then maybe about five or six years it could, where I've got to could be done from from a younger age like to that point so so maybe that's the more realistic and help helpful answer because different things I put into place along the journey so I went teetotal and stopped drinking seven years ago and I learned about diet properly and read more books about nutrition when I was already several years into it and I kind of just looked up routines for the first two years on the internet and just did cookie cutter stuff without reading specific books on full bodybuilding program until maybe year three of it. So it can take a very long time if you add in the detail of each piece, you know, year by year. If you do everything right from day one and you have the right mentorship and guidance, perhaps you can get as good as you possibly could get in less than half that time or maybe the point I've got to in about five or six years. So the literal answer, 20 years, maybe the more helpful answer, this could be done in five years, six years, if you're, uh, if you're really into it and you're gonna get everything right. Next question, are you a fan or follower of the carnivore diet? The answer is a big yes. And it's become more popular online. There's a lot of noise around it because of the, the Petersons and people like Sean Baker and it's actually not a new thing in the bodybuilding world. One of the main influences for me with the bodybuilding uh, knowledge that's out there was Vince, Vince Gironda. So he was like the original guru on getting really, really shredded. And he was probably the first person that had really kind of what we consider by today's standards contest conditioning. Because if you look at all those pictures back in the pre-golden era you know what some people call the bronze and silver era they were kind of like full and soft and kind of brawny looking but not in any way modern condition you know you know these great bodybuilders like older old time guys like bill pearl and stuff like that it's not it's not the look that's the standard now i'm not saying one is better than the other it's just the subjective standard evolves and changes but someone who was kind of before his time in terms of muscle quality and definition and detail over size was Vince Gironda and he he was the guru that all of the film stars got sent to um, to get into shape and cut weight to to look good and you know the face look a little bit more chiseled and stuff like that for for films and he was advocating a steak and egg diet and maybe only eating carbohydrates every fourth day so he was kind of an early proponent of what we now call carb cycling but he was saying well eat a bowl of vegetables <laughs> like once every four days not not the low day is one or two hundred and the high day is is like six hundred this was really 
basically carnivore and a little bowl of veg um, every three to four days. And he'd noticed early on that you can kind of look more flat and lose vascularity once you get to day four, five, six of um, eating nothing but fat and protein. So what we'd now call being depleted or, or flat. He, he discovered all of these things many decades ago and he, he famously met Arnold when he went over to the States and said, and said, oh, he's, you know, he's, he's, he's too fat and all this kind of, he didn't put it as politely as that, <laughs> but he said all of this kind of thing and he was, he was really all about definition and it's really influenced me how rapid it can cause that fat loss and, and provide you fast progress without, without feeling like you're hungry. Another reason why I really like it, aside from aside from not going hungry and it being being sort of passed to me through reading the history and Vince Gironda and stuff like that, is when I delved more into the nuts and bolts of nutrition, I realised that the most nutrient-dense foods, calorie for calorie, were organ meats, red meat, eggs and fatty fish. And so if you're going to cut down a diet to its, its um, most fundamental parts or what would be most beneficial to the body, that would leave you at something close to a carnivore diet, if not a complete carnivore diet. If you want to be really specific about it, sometimes it's not technically a zero carb diet. Not a lot of people know this, but in each egg, there is 0.5 grams of, of uh, carbohydrate. But when you're under 10 grams for the day, or you're eating all animal produce, that's, that's close enough. And it's very effective. I like it. It makes me feel more alert than when I'm, I'm in my growing phases and eating much more carbohydrates, usually from white rice and other starch. Feel much more alert, uh, makes your skin better, and clear thinking, nutrient dense foods with every meal, less hunger. It's um, it's a great tool, but it's one tool of many in the toolbox. And if you're trying to grow, I think I think it can hold you back a little bit. Or if you're trying to look full as well as cut down, then you might consider transitioning slowly into it and then adopting a carb cycling approach, a little bit like I was discussing a moment ago with with what Vince Gironda realised. But definitely an important tool in the toolbox and gets you focused on nutrient quality, nutrition and quality and nutrient rich foods, whole foods. Um, I'm all for it. Next question. How can I get fully capped delts? Right, well, delts, he means, uh, he means the deltoids, the, the side of the shoulder, the, the bit that kind of gives you that the, the width and enhances V taper from looking broader at the top. So I think it is a really important part of uh, complete physique. I think if you overdevelop the trapezius, um, the bit of the trapezius that we usually call the traps is the upper part of it that gives you that kind of like losing your neck, like sloping up um, shape. In the trapezius if you get too much of that rather than the deltoid it can cause a kind of rounded appearance to the whole shoulder which negates from the look of, of, of width and looking broad up top when you view the whole physique top to toe from a distance so i think this is a really important question for a bodybuilder or any kind of physique athlete like men's physique or classic it, it's um it's emphasizing the deltoids rather than the trapezius to to have that that broad look of the, the bodybuilder as opposed to kind of like chunky and, and, and losing that, that illusion of width with too much trapezius, not enough deltoids. So I'm rambling on a little bit. Let's get to the question. How do you get that capped delt look? And there's two parts to it. One is the actual complete development of the deltoids and the other is um, being lean enough to show the separation where it'll give more separation between the deltoid and the, the rest of the arm, particularly the triceps and separation from the trapezius near where, near where the, the edge of your shoulder girdle is. So part one, the actual complete development of it. Most bodybuilders, because they do more, especially they're, they're newer at training and they, they focus on what's enjoyable and the, what they can see in the mirror on their own body. We call it the mirror muscles when someone focuses on chest and arms and quads, but neglects hamstrings, calves, their whole back, their triceps, in, you know, relatively speaking to the, the front stuff. As part of that, people tend to do more pushing than pulling as a new, a, a new trainer, new at lifting. So they'll be doing more bench pressing and more incline pressing than they'll be doing, say, 
uh, rowing and pull-ups. And so what happens with all of those compound movements that are a push where we're primarily trying to get to the pectorals, they recruit the triceps, but they also recruit the, the, the anterior head of the deltoids, or what we call the front delts. So when you look at the deltoid, um, it looks like it's split into three main parts and we refer to those as the front delt, the medial delt, the side and the, the rear delt that's sort of like behind. And this is most visible like in a back double biceps pose. So this one viewed from the back with the arm twisted all the way back there, you can see the three parts. And on many bodybuilders, it probably most, the front delt, which is now positioned on the top in that pose, is, is more developed than the other two parts of it, particularly the rear delt. But, but the front delt looks amazing from the front and combined with the chest, presenting that kind of top shelf mass. But that's not really the part of it that gives the capped look, where it adds to looking broad and looks rounded over the edge. The rounded over the edge look is more from the side delt and the rear. So to prevent the front from taking over in any of the shoulder exercises, I would recommend from very early on, you look at that imbalance before it creeps in too far and you focus your isolation movements on the other two parts, the side and the rear part of the deltoid. So. What that would look like in a shoulder routine is perhaps do all of your heavy pressing first. So maybe your barbell presses or dumbbell presses or, or uh, Smith machine presses, any, any kind of heavy pressing first, because that's most demanding. And there's a few exceptions, but very, very typically we do the, the heavy lifting at the start, the compound movements at the start. But I'd say as soon as that's done, you know, one heavy exercise of pressing, move on to doing the rear delts first and the, the side delts after that. Maybe do two exercises for each if you've already started developing an, in, an imbalance and you'll get that mass that creates the rounded on the side and the width. So for rear delts, you're looking at bent over dumbbell raises. So you lean forwards and raise like this. It's really helpful if you put a bench to lock you in at about 45 degrees and raise, raise out so it keeps you in that leaning forward position com comfortably. You can also do it with cables. You can do it with cables up the top and pull like this, or there's some machines where you lie down on a pad and your face goes in the hole and then your elbows go underneath and they come back like this. Some of the, um, the chest fly machines, they go like this. If you change the, um, the orientation of the handles on it, you can hold the side of it and sit the other way around and pull back like this. There's many, many exercises that I'll show in other videos that, that isolate or concentrate on the rear delts. Then you move forward one section and that's when you're doing your standing dumbbell raises or cables, whichever you can feel it in best. Or some of the other machines, there's some of the machines where you sit forward uh, with the pad on your abdomen and your elbows go under and you hold the handles and you raise like this at the sides. There's other way you stand and you raise like this. The, the advantage of those over dumbbells is that the dumbbell is always working against gravity. So as it comes through this bit, there's no resistance, no resistance, and then you get all the resistance here. Whereas if it's on a machine that's linked to a cable and a, and a, a pulley and a wake stack and all the rest of it, you get the resistance all the way through the arc of the, the movement that's, that's working the deltoid. So I, I do think that now we have all these machines, one of the benefits is to look at the ones where we can get the resistance all the way through the whole profile of the exercise. So loads of choices that I'll show in some other videos, but that's what you want to concentrate your efforts on. And that, that, that's probably all the isolation work you're going to do. If, you, if you've already got front delts more developed than the rest, probably no need for front raises or or high incline pressing or anything that really concentrates on the front just get the heavy pressing um, overhead out of the way and then work all of the rear and side delts so that was part one part two is the capped look that's you know coming from the separation which is coming from how lean you are so anything related to diet and cutting down and body fat levels will Will be relevant to this and as you lose um, you lose the subcutaneous fat under the skin on all of the muscles you'll see the kind of separation and that kind of like click in where it, where it has that capped kind of cannonball look and the, the width to it and um, 
just enhances the whole the whole quality of it. So definitely relevant to that look is how lean you get as well. Next question. Do you think heavy compounds with less mind muscle connection or do you think the opposite? So he's asking which is better out of heavy compound lifting and kind of isolation work and mind muscle connection um, and really focusing on form, that kind of thing. Well, there's a place for both. And I think it depends particularly on which exercise you're looking at. Some of them are kind of unavoidable to um, use a bit of sway or involve the whole body. I mean, barbell squatting, for instance, does kind of use all the muscles in your body to do it. Um, a lot of the rowing is very hard to do it without jerking. It's, it's really beneficial to get some heavy weight on there. So I'd say with the main power exercises, um, go heavy and work really, really hard. That applies to all of it, actually. The most important thing is that you're working really, really hard. But particularly with the heavy compounds, you go heavy. But there's certain isolation ones where the purpose of you doing it is negated if you're swinging all over the place. So now we're talking like bicep curls or hamstring curls. I think for those more targeted muscles, and once you get into the second part of your workout, focus more on mind-muscle connection. So I can't say that one is better than the other. If I had to say... If you push me to say, I'd say the heavy lifting is more important, particularly early on, that you get a base of size and strength, and then you refine from there, and then, then you're using them about equally. Hope that helps. Next question. This is quite a funny one. What do you think of so many guys in classic physique having a moustache? Well, I think I'll state the obvious and say I think... It's just going. It's just copying Chris Bumstead. It's it's going too far with that kind of thing. I think when I think about the classic look, or maybe the golden era and the old days, like I can't really think of many of them that had mustaches. I can only really, off the top of my head who he'd maybe call like classic or the classic era. I think the only ones I can think of are like Ed Corney and Samir Banu. It was not like a widespread thing, but now you've got everyone um, <laughs> competes in classics considering whether to have a moustache or not. I think, I think just sort of, you know, get your own look. That's the Chris Bumstead thing. And I don't know if it, you, you know, it's not Mr. Shoreditch. You know, it, it, classic doesn't mean like hipster. I think, how far are we going with this? Do, you know, do you need to turn up to your contest on a penny farthing and have kind of your avocado sourdoughs instead of um, peanut butter on rice cakes or you know attach like Salvador Dali and a monocle no 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 just 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 look what is a style that looks good for you and uh, yeah too many mustaches running around far too many and lastly back to a serious question can you do bodybuilding and another sport I would say it depends at what level and what the other sport you're considering is. I think if you define bodybuilding most broadly, and that's anyone that's using a gym primarily to change their physical appearance, or their, their physique, which is how I like to define it a lot of time, because I want all of this to be the, the, the toolbox of, of um, competitive bodybuilding to be applicable and useful and broken down to the advantage and usefulness of everyone. So I do try to you know even though i love competitions and pro bodybuilding and everything i do try and contextualize it for anyone that's that's in the gym to achieve their ideal which is a form of bodybuilding defined more broadly so if you are looking for a look that is not as extreme as the competitors you just want a bit more muscle and to you know get in shape or what people would call like tone up and stuff yeah, you can totally play um, lots of other sports. I'd say if the other sport is one that is likely to end in injury for you, so the fighting sports or, you know, hard contact sports like um, American football or, or, or rugby here, I, th I think if if you look at that and decide that changing your body is, is definitely the number one priority, I'd say, like, you know, ease off the... Um, ease off the fighting or the, the heavy contact sports probably but you're probably absolutely fine to do like athletics running um, badminton tennis um a, you know a whole number of other sports and they could be very complementary to your over, overall fitness and what you use to make cardio more interesting when you're when you're cutting down wanting to um look ripped for your holiday or whatever it is that you're doing i'd say like totally a place for it but i think 
when it comes to the more competitive side of bodybuilding and looking to get on stage where you're looking really to have as much muscle as possible and as least fat and nothing interfere with the process. I think you're very limited in, in the other sports so you can combine with that and then not kind of take away from going to the absolute maximum with bodybuilding. So you may be looking at something for flexibility could complement quite well. So if you did kind of yoga or something or you, you did... Um, power walking or you, you know not there, there's only going to be a few that are really going to complement it probably all others in terms of the time commitment and you having to adjust your nutrition to it and stuff are probably gonna you know one two five or ten percent hold you back a little bit if you if you want to go as far as this far at this as possible so depends which sport and depends which version or how far with bodybuilding i hope that helps that's all for today cheers